dollarshapeclub.com slash Colin. dollarshapeclub.com slash Colin. Um, you know, it's funny. We had Jay Glazer was on about a – we were talking about Tom Brady and people yesterday when that documentary, when he said, I've given my life up for football, people like freak out like, whoa, whoa, that is it. And my thing is, listen, man, he goes for the two things that matter, family and football. He goes a mile deep on them. He's really vulnerable. I think it's great. Here's Jay Glazer when he was on our show, and he makes a really inter- – wait to the end of what he says. Go ahead, Jay Glazer. Tom Brady works as hard as anybody in this league. He is – he has the sickness. Right? I call it the sickness, right? If you want to be great, you got to have a sickness. you got to be great. You, you got to be sick about it. You have to constantly nonstop Obsessed. work, work, work. Absolutely. It's, it's an obsession. He is as sick – as anybody else when it comes to winning, he has it. it it's, and you think his home life's pretty damn good. You know, he has something else he could possibly do. Yeah. But, man, he is just absolutely obsessed with being the best. And if you're obsessed with it and you put the, the work in, usually you're, you're going to be, uh, I don't say you're going to be great, but you're certainly on the right path because so many other guys are not willing to put that work in. Oh, there's no question. A lot of people. You ever watch a great stand-up comedian? You can tell the guys to put the work in. I go to a, I go to Hermosa stand up a, a comedy store all the time. You can watch the guys that put the work in. <laughs> you can you can see the guys that are naturally funny, have created a set, and they just go up and they just chop it up for about. And then you see the guys you're like, oh, he's aspirational. He wants to be great. He wants to have his own show. He wants to. You can tell. Like you just don't. Naturally funny does not make you millions of dollars on stage. Chris Rock. I don't need to see a lot of Chris Rock to know that guy worked on that set for nine months. John Mul- Mulaney is another guy. Like, that guy works on his set for nine months. They just don't pop on a show or pop on a stage. So um, let me segue into this, which is pretty uh, remarkable. Uh, we've said this through the years. Great creates clarity. Like, when Andrew Luck walks into this league and he goes 11-5 and five with a loopy owner, a bad GM, a mediocre coach, and no pro bowlers, and he's 11-5. and five with the worst roster, the Colts, and the worst O-line at the time in the league, you're like, okay, that's great. That's what great players do. They just put guys on their back, and they carry them to a lot of wins. Uh, he went 11-5, and 11-5, and 11-5, and five, and not until the third year did he have an offensive line that could even marginally protect him. That's great. Doesn't matter. You, don't, you, don't have to, you can throw picks. You can make mistakes. But great, it jumps off the television screen. And it, gets, and it creates clarity. And what it does is, oh, that's what great is. Like Deshaun Watson has 19 touchdowns in like three, you know, seven games. You're like, oh, that's what great looks like. It creates a clarity. Brad Stevens is the best coach in the NBA. Not Steve Kerr. It's not Steve Kerr. Warriors won with Luke Walton and Mike Brown. It's not Greg Popovich, who hasn't nearly been as good since Tim Duncan left. Best coach in the NBA is Brad Stevens. The guy's absolutely remarkable. He got Butler to the national championship. Okay, that's incredible. Having Steph Curry, Draymond Green, Clay Thompson, and Kevin Durant and a good bench and winning a bunch of games, Luke Walton did that. Mike Brown did that. Nothing against Steve Kerr, but the best coach is Brad Stevens. Brad Stevens yesterday got a coach fired. He got Jason Kidd in Milwaukee fired. That was Brad Stevens that got him fired. The, the owners didn't fire him. Brad Stevens got him fired because Brad Stevens is amazing. Other GMs now are looking and going, well, Brad Stevens lost Kelly Olnick, his number two player, Gordon Hayward, in the first quarter of the first game of the season, 29 a game from Isaiah Thomas, his two best defensive players, Avery Bradley and Jay Crowder, certainly among them. They lost four of their five, four of their top six scores, and Boston is 34 and 13, number one in the East. Boston has five more wins this year than last. And their second best player, I think, is Al Horford. Lost four of their top six starters. Here's how good Brad Stevens is. Brad Stevens gained a bad defensive player, Kyrie Irving. He lost two of his best defensive players, Avery Bradley and Jay Crowder. And the Celtics rank number one in defense. It's called coaching. It's why Alabama keeps winning the championship and why Belichick keeps getting to Super Bowls. Coaching matters. Brad Stevens got Jason Kidd fired. Jason Kidd's got a guy called the Greek Freak, 28 a game. Chris Middleton, 20 a game. Eric Bledsoe, 18 a game. Rookie of the year, Malcolm Brogdon last year. Two really good defenders, and they're awful defensively. Jason Kidd didn't get himself fired. Brad Stevens got him fired because great creates clarity. What Brad Stevens is doing in Boston is ridiculous. 
They they turned over almost their entire roster. Turned it over. Lost two of their best defensive players, and they've gotten better defensively. They lost Gordon Hayward. Man overboard first quarter. That would be a psychological death blow for any other team. And they're number one, five wins better than last year at this time. This is what Saban does to the SEC. He creates clarity. Oh, you can win almost all your games if you're well coached. Brad Stevens now is becoming that. Is that if he can do it with this group, he's depending on a 19-year-old, a 21-year-old, and Kyrie Irving, who had a reputation as a top five awful defender, at guard in the NBA. Oh, yeah, my bad. And Al Horford and not much of a bench. Brad Stevens got Jason Kidd fired. Christine with the news. No, 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 no. Turn on the news. This is the Herdline News. This is such an interesting story that's coming out today on so many different levels. But Matt Patricia, I mean, all but officially is the next Lions head coach. Yeah. And apparently he's already been meeting with the staff and has told them that they will no longer be on the team, like the assistants, that they no longer have jobs yeah. there. But he's not even officially the head coach. Also, how does he have time right now while preparing for the AFC Championship and the Super Bowl? Well, they probably, the way, the way it probably works is you get 24 hours. Like when you win the game, Belichick says, we're in Tuesday morning at 9. So you probably spend the day Monday. Players getting your Super Bowl tickets ready. Okay. And coaches preparing for your next gig. So he probably gave both Josh and Patricia 24 hours to spread your gospel. By the way, this is generally what great coaches do. They fire the whole staff. They don't want anything lingering from the previous mess. So he just he did the right thing then by giving I think them so. all a heads up? No, no. I, I think Matt Patricia said, listen, guys, I'm bringing in all my guys. I'm bringing in my group of guys. You see this in college football where a new coach comes in. He'll maybe retain, like, the best recruiter on the staff, he'll fire the other 14 yeah. guys. I just hope it's really official because that would kind of suck. Yeah, just think if, if one he of the didn't... guys is like, okay, I'll find a new job, and then Matt Patricia's not the head coach. That would be unfortunate. Uh, Blake Bortles and Jacksonville have some situations to figure out now. Yeah. So Bortles' contract for next season, he would get around $19 million, yeah. but Jacksonville wouldn't owe, them that, owe him that if they cut ties with him by March. However, Blake Bortles says he would like to stay. I've enjoyed my four years here in Jacksonville, and I would love to be able to play here for as long as they'll let me. Um, and, you know, what they do and all the decisions that are made, you know, it's kind of outside of my control. So um, I'd be, you know, thrilled to be able to stay here and play here. And, um, you know, hopefully that, that can help. Do you think they should... Um, I, you know, I, I feel I hate, I hate saying this, but he's not worth 19 million. Now, there's a bunch of guys on the market. There's Case Keenum's on the market. Um, there's Teddy Bridgewater's potentially on the market. Potentially, I think the uh, Sam Bradford I'd pass on. Although I think he's a really good talent, he just can't stay healthy. Uh, Kirk Cousins would cost me 25 million, but I think he's good, not great. I think you're. I think Jacksonville's largely. You know, can they franchise tag him? Can you franchise tag Bortles for a year? I think it's a weird situation where, you know, it, it's a tough situation. The market doesn't bear a lot of fruit here. There's not a lot out there. I will tell you this. If you gave me the choice, Christine, to play Blake Bortles 19 and I could pay Case Keenum 16, I think I may go Case Keenum. It's by inches, not feet. But okay. this, is, this is, Christine, the real dilemma people get in is that the quarterback's really, really valuable, and you can obviously get a long way without a great quarterback. I mean, Nick Foles is in the Super Bowl, but the problem becomes when you have to pay him. Like, Case Keenum's making nothing now, so the Vikings are fine. But then you wake up one morning and like, oh, my God, we got to pay Case Keenum, like, $19 million. It's, it's, it's the hardest decision in football. Do you literally replace the most important position for a guy you know is, is not capable of carrying you if you have injuries. It's a tough call. Okay, the final story. I, listen, I, there are a lot of people out there that think that I will just troll LeBron James for anything he does and that yeah. I'm a hater. But I've started to realize that LeBron is actually the biggest troll out there, so he yeah. probably deserves this. Mm -hmm. And when he does things like he did on his Instagram, I, I mean, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. There's really no choice. All right. He is sitting on 29,993 career points. Yeah. 
So he's set to pass the 30,000 point threshold tonight against the Spurs. Yeah. So what does LeBron do? He congratulates himself <laughs> for 30,000 points before he even has scored 30,000 points. And he did it with a post on Instagram, which I'm just going to read to you because this is ridiculous. And by the way, it's like a young LeBron James, right? Want to be one of the first to congratulate you. He's talking about himself here on this accomplishment slash achievement tonight that you'll reach. Only a handful has reached, seen it, too. And while I know it's never been a goal of yours for the beginning, try, please try yeah. to take a moment for yourself on how you've done it. The house you're about to be a part of only has six seats in it as of now, but one more will be added, and you should be very proud and honored to be invited inside. There's so many people to thank who's helped this even become possible. So thank them all. And when you finally get your moment alone to yourself, smile, look up to the higher skies and say thank you. So with that said, congrats again, young king, with an emoji of a king. One love, hashtag of course, strive for greatness, yeah. hashtag the kid from Akron. Are you kidding me? That's a little over the Are top. Are you kidding me? <laughs> You're congratulating yourself before you, could you not just wait a day? Even the day later, it would have been obnoxious, but come on. You, you know, you could have put a self, you could have put a picture of yourself in high school and said, um, um, tonight's going to be special. I know where it all started. And just leave it exactly. there. Exactly. And you know what? Great. Good for you. Yeah. You should celebrate Because I like this. the picture. It's, it's a, he, look, he doesn't even look like LeBron. I want to be one of the first to congratulate you. Don't you know if you're one of the first to congratulate yourself? <laughs> this is just obnoxious. And, and this is why. You know, I, I just, he asks for it. I'm sorry. That's funny. That's good, good story. story. Christine Thanks. with the news. Well, that's the news. And thanks for stopping by. The Herd Live Over news. a decade in the NFL, part of that Super Bowl championship with the Saints, our friend Reggie Bush stopping by the show today. I bet, Reggie, let's be honest. All, you, all, you, all you players out there, is there, just, just acknowledge it, is there a little jealousy, envy, or resentment about New England's there again? <laughs> of course there is. You kidding me? Is there? <laughs> I mean, listen, it's uh, a lot of us would love to have played for the New England Patriots. Um, but, you know, listen, when you can – there's a lot of guys that come through this league, um, a lot of uh, Hall of Famers, a lot of guys that have made Pro Bowls that yep. have not been to a Super Bowl, a single Super Bowl. So, so Hey, Calvin Johnson didn't get to the playoffs much. No. And he's one of the best players yeah. in my life. Right, right. So when you say that – now, you know that, Reggie, if you went to New England, they wouldn't pay as much. Right. The practices are <laughs> – so here's my, here's my thing. <laughs> Would you be willing to sacrifice some money? And the fact is, they kind of the players less important than the system. How does yeah. that land for you? Well, it, it depends. For me, it depends on at what point in my career. Like if it was the last like two or three years, then I would have been there in a heartbeat. Right. <laughs> but you know, in the beginning of those years, when you know, listen, at, this, at the end of the day, this is a business. Well, right? Of course, and, it is. And you still have to look at you know. You still have to make as much money as you possibly can. You before have seven this years game. to play. You have to. You have to because when the opportunity is gone and when you can't play anymore, you are not getting that opportunity back. It's right. gone. Once it's gone, it's gone. So I would say that, um, listen, you, like you said, you know that you're not going to get paid there. Uh, because in, cause Brady is the one that – he's the driving force of that team. By the way – Belichick's an architect, but Brady's the driving force. By the way, with running backs, if you fumble, Reggie – Oh, you're done. <laughs> he might not see you. For a month? <laughs> Literally, James White's the best player in the Super Bowl. Yeah. I don't think I saw him in September. <laughs> At all. <laughs> I mean, they just – it's funny what At they all. do with running backs. Yeah. If you talk to guys that play for New England backs, is it a sophisticated system? Like, is it a difficult – I'll tell you what's interesting. If you look at their team in the last several years, they've abandoned young players. Yeah. They yeah. want old. They want Matt Slater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They yeah. want old dudes. Yeah. Is that because, Reggie, you hear it's a complicated system? Um, I think it's just Belichick's uh, what he likes to do. He likes to go and get guys. He likes to go and find guys who, you know, to other teams may have no use for them. Uh, but he feels like, you know, listen, I'll make a star out of this guy. You know what I mean? And, and he's done it time after time, right? And, and he's, he hasn't really given Brady, like, elite 
receivers, elite players around him. I mean, Randy Moss, you can count him on one hand. For about an hour. Yeah. But it's mostly been Dion Branch yeah. and uh, Danny Amendola, yeah. who, by the way, had an, guys. Danny had an unbelievable game. Yeah. Holy God. Really good game. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's funny. I want to go to your uh, um, New Orleans situation. Um, New Orleans is one of those unique American cities. It doesn't mm-hmm. smell, look, taste, feel like anywhere else. It's mm-hmm. really its own mm-hmm. culture. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't say that about a lot of cities. That's yeah. nothing against Indianapolis and Orlando. But I don't. But when I'm in New Orleans, I feel different. Yeah. Like it's a late night yeah. city. It is. It is its own unique culture. Yeah. And I understand Drew Brees, post Katrina, Bounty mm-hmm. Gate is mm-hmm. a big part of that community. Mm-hmm. But I watch that game. Well, Drew Brees is. I don't know about the Bounty Gate. No, 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 no. It, but he is. All that stuff vanishes yeah because drew is above it all right so when the saints have a bad year you're always like you feel good about the saints because drew's like the world's best brand right right? (laughs) and i made this argument last week sometimes that organization's let him down they've Mm -hmm. had five defensive coordinators in 11 years Mm -hmm. a rookie cornerback out of a timeout whiffs Mm -hmm. don't you think it's reasonable for drew Brees to go to the market and just say i just want to test the waters elsewhere (laughs) No, I don't think so. Why? Because he's 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 a he's a lifetime Saints, um, you know, he's a lifetime Saint, and and uh, listen, everything that he's done there, all the work that he's put in, when he came to New Orleans, uh, nobody knew what he was going to be. They didn't know if he was going to be able to bounce back because he had the shoulder injury. Right. It was it was my rookie year, so there were a lot of questions about how Drew was going to be able to finish off his career. You know, a lot of people thought he was done. Uh, and he only had two options. It was Miami or, or the Saints. And the Saints doctors gave him the pass. They did. Miami's did not. They did not. And that's why Nick Saban's coaching in college. <laughs> <laughs> is absolutely right. Now, take my audience, Reggie. Take your time on this. You walk through the doors in New Orleans. Yes. Just Drew Brees. Mm-hmm. Like, t- talk about leadership. Yes. What separates him from other players? Yeah. There, there were times where I would try to uh, I would try to beat Drew into the lock, into the facility uh, because I always knew he was one of the hardest working guys on the team. Um, he always set a great example about just work ethic and how to prepare. Um, and I knew he was always one of the first ones in the facility and one of the last ones to leave. So there were times where. I would try to wake up as early as I possibly could. You know, the, it's still dark outside to beat him into the facility. And I would walk into the facility and he would already be in there watching film. Um, he'd been there before the coaches were there. There'd be no cars in the parking lot. It'd be one car, there'd be his, you know. So that's the type of guy he is. That's the type of leader that he is. And, and there's a reason why he's been that successful in New Orleans. And it's not just by showing up on Sundays. It's all the work in between, like you spoke to about Chris Rock. You know, it's all that work that you put in the week of that people don't see. They see him shine on Sundays, but they don't know that he's one of the first guys in the, in the facility. He's in there before the coaches. Uh, he's one of the hardest working men on the team. He's one of the the, the, big, the greatest competitors of, of the NFL. So, You know, uh, Reggie Bush joining us, when, when you look at um, there's, new, there's new hirings happening, I like the idea of Josh McDaniels going to Andrew Luck. Yeah. So to me, I'm like, oh, that'll work. Yeah. Kyle Shanahan getting Jimmy Garoppolo. Mm-hmm. Oh, that'll work. Mm-hmm. But then I see Matt Patricia, defensive guy, going to Matt Stafford. Mm-hmm. You've been in Detroit. I really worry about this. I think it's become Jack Del Rio and Derek Carr two years later mm-hmm. doesn't work. Right. Like, I'm a believer in this. And tell me if I'm wrong, Reggie, that quarterbacks are way better mm-hmm. when the guy in the room is an offensive coach. Well, uh, well then... If that was the case, then Brady and Belichick wouldn't. That's right. But what Belichick what does, is he empowers Charlie Weiss and Josh McDaniels. Right. So what what Bill really does is he hires world class mm-hmm. coordinators mm-hmm. and overpays them. Yes. I mean, those. That's why Josh McDaniels has had four offers. He's finally taken one. It's Andrew yeah. Luck. Right. Josh has passed on about three jobs. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be very interesting to find the next Josh McDaniels because Brady probably doesn't have the tolerance for a guy that doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> right. But but talk about that. When you were in New Orleans, mm-hmm. did it feel different than being in Detroit with like a Schwartz yeah. compared to a Peyton? Yeah. Did the room feel different? It felt different. Um, it felt different for a number of reasons. I, I think, listen, with, with Matt Patricia, he has work cut up for him. But if you give – Matt Stafford, a really good defense, which is one of the things that they haven't had there. Yeah. You know, for most of the time he's been there, they haven't had a really, really good, solid top 10 defense year in and year out like Brady has had. Right. And listen, Patricia isn't going to call the offensive. 
plays. We know that. So it's about who he brings in. Who's the guy that's going to bring? He's going to bring in to help Matt Stafford. Who's the guy who's going to be calling the plays? That's going to get Stafford into the right position. Is going to help him to to be able to read the coverages and see the defenses. Uh, and he's coming from obviously from a great system, so he knows how to get it done. He's seen it done year in and year out under Belichick. So. As far as uh, formula, Patricia is going to have it. As far as um, preparation, you know, Patricia is going to understand that how to get there. And as far as um, you know, putting together, um, you know, the uh, the mentality, changing mentality, and the culture of the organization of the Detroit Lions, Patricia has that, and he will be able to get that done over there. Now, again, it's going to be about who he brings in to 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 help Stafford. If That's you if you whiff on a coordinator, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. It, Matt's been a different. Matt Stafford is like Matt Ryan. He's as good as his coordinator. Exactly. We know yeah. they're both talented. Yeah. Stafford with Jim Bob Cooter and Matt Ryan mm-hmm. with Kyle Shanahan mm-hmm. are different players. Way different. Yeah. People forget about three years ago, Matt Stafford, people were wildly unhappy with his interceptions, mm-hmm. yeah. couldn't make big plays late in games. Finally, yeah. we watched this weekend Leonard Fournette, terrific player. A couple of weeks ago, last week I had Alvin Kamara on with the Saints. Mm-hmm. You're a former running back. You list your top five running backs. Number yeah. one, you put is Le'Veon Bell. Yeah. Here's my thing. If you were that team, he failed a drug test or two, he gets hurt, he can at times be a little bit of a distraction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What is the balance? You don't have Ezekiel Elliott in there. Well, I, listen, you only gave me five. So, I mean, I like Ezekiel Elliott in there, but when you look at the year that he had this year, um, I would say Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram together are were a lot more were successful, more successful than he was. Right. Because he missed – you know, so many games. So I guess year. that's my point. With Le'Veon Bell, sometimes Shady McCoy, Ezekiel Elliott. Mm-hmm. If you ran a franchise, how much are you willing to put up with for talent? What is the line? You've been yeah. in locker rooms, Reggie. Yep. Le'Veon Bell has had a drug expansion or two. Yeah. Injuries, I don't blame him, but he has been hurt. Yeah. And we had two days before the championship game talking salary. Yeah. You ran a team. Yeah. Would you sign him? I would sign him. Um, and... I would make sure that I also put a good group of veterans around him to keep him under control and to make sure that he was doing the right things, saying the right things, and that he was showing up on time and that there were, you know, listen, I've been on veteran teams and I've been on teams where we had zero leadership at all. There is a tremendous difference when you have no leadership on a team. You, you were, uh, your Saints team had leadership. We you, had leadership. Your Dolphin team did not. We had zero leadership. And you that by the way that that locker room was man overboard. Exactly. Yeah. No yeah. lock no leaders. No leaders at all. I mean, <laughs> listen, we and we had great players. You know, we, we had Brandon Marshall, uh Devon Best who was playing as good as any slot receiver at the Cameron time. Cameron Wake. Cam Wake. You had a good old line, Jake really Long, <laughs> Richie Incognito. Yeah, exactly. We had a good team. We just didn't have the leadership that we needed. We had Vontae Davis, Sean Smith. Oh, my God. We had some good players over there. Carlos Dansby at linebacker. Holy hell. <laughs> and you knew as you knew in that locker room, you could just tell it wasn't tight? No, it wasn't. It, it, like, it give me an example, like like the music, the time, the screwing off, well, late we had, the practice. I mean, listen, we, had, we had fights in the locker rooms. Uh, we had fights. It seemed like we had a fight every day of practice. Uh, you know, we had guys show up. Uh, I'm not going to say any names, but I remember one guy showed up. Uh, he had missed all of the morning meetings. This is the day before the game and showed up, like, as we were doing a walkthrough. And that oh, was about man. three hours of missed meeting time. So that's just what we dealt with because we didn't have the leadership and guys weren't being held accountable, uh, you know, on that team. And, and um, you know, there was, there was no control. I mean, I felt like I was on the replacements. <laughs> 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 Reggie Bush, good seeing you, bud. Yeah, appreciate it. In L.A., it's the herd. It's 6 a.m., 40 million Americans.